Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you to the Writers Guild. Thank you to uh, Chinese and Entertainment. Thank you to Michael and myself, Business of Creating. Welcome to Developing and Distributing Projects for China. So everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, let me see, are we doing our introductions right now? So uh, our Good amazing panelists. Yeah, we'll do, start with the panel. We'll, if you can pull up the first slides, we'll get there. And I, to answer the question, Robert, um, hopefully you can hear the audio. Okay, so uh, my panelists, Thomas, Patrick, Winnie, welcome. Welcome to the panel. Turn on your video and audio. We're playing with each other now. And so ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, may I jump yeah. right in? Yeah, I think it's okay. good. And what I'll just do is do the quick intro on the first slide. Um, we've been planning for this panel for a few months as an initial idea. Um, and particularly with China having been expected to surpass North American box office last year, although the pandemic kind of threw things off, there's a great potential for entertainment properties in that country. You know, yet there are distinctly different ways Western TV shows and films are allowed to get into the country via quotas, which we will talk about. Um, with most attendees of this panel being mostly in the U.S., the focus on this will be on Western style stories and filmmakers to see how projects could work in China. We'll also talk about how other foreign films too get into China. And because China's different ways of doing business with government being very pivotal, you'll see a lot more data in the first part of the panel to explain how this market works, which is critical to getting projects approved and accepted. Um, we'll start, you know, we'll start off with some more like film box office, but we'll also talk about TV later on. Um, but, you know, as Jen said, you know, we're glad you're here. We hope that you enjoy today's panel. We're all here to learn together. So ask questions. We're all here to make our industry better, our projects better, and perhaps even our own personal lives better. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, Michael, I'm jumping in because, of course, one of the things we like to make sure we do is introduce ourselves to each other. So obviously, when we're uh, in person, it's easy to turn to the person to your left and the person to your right and say, hi, I'm so and so. Here's my card. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, in the chat right now put your name, where you're from, what you do. I know we've had people start uh, writers groups from this. We've had people connect and do other projects together. Now's your opportunity. Please jump in the chat, introduce yourselves. I'm gonna see if I can go to the next slide while we talk about it. it's us. Michael, it's a picture of us. Look at that. <laughs> so we are business of creating ladies and gentlemen, and we founded this uh, panel series, live interactive. So yes, please ask questions about projects. And we founded this because we wanted to empower ourselves and other people so that we, when we get in the room and we're talking with people, we're the people they want to work with. That is a super duper quick about us. Obviously, please go to our website, businessofcreating.org and find out more, sign up for our newsletter and be the first to be in the know about future events. I'm going to pass that over now to Enid over at the Writers Guild Foundation. Enid, tell us more. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Enid Portuguese from the Writers Guild Foundation. We are a Los Angeles-based nonprofit that's dedicated to preserving and promoting the craft of writing for film and TV. Everything we do is open to the public, including our library. Um, we're closed right now, but we do have... Uh, library live Zoom sessions twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you have questions about scripts, formats, anything, or just want to chit chat with our librarians and other writers, definitely join us. We also do tons of these Zoom events. We've got a couple of great ones happening this month. So please head over to our website, wgfoundation.org and RSVP for any or all. So thank you so much. And now- Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and we're now throwing it over to Yue. Yue, do you mind just talking about, about Chinese entertainment? Hey, thank you, Michael. Everyone, my name is Yue Wang, and it's my pleasure to present you CIE, Chinese in Entertainment, a nonprofit organization with a mission of connecting and empowering talent from all over the Asia. Um, under CIE banner, we have many other events such as monthly mixer, script competition, writer's workshop, and LA Chinese Film Festival, which will be our fourth year this year. Uh, so please do check out our website and I will leave my contact info below at, in the chat as well, uh, in case you want to connect and know more about Chinese in entertainment. Thank you so much. Now back to Jen. <laughs> Thank you everybody. All right, so a quick 
recap here of some of our past panels. What you'll notice is we've got quite a variety of topics and a quite a variety of fabulous experts, which you're going to see more of today. Uh, we go from creating your ripos and sizzles, developing your project, distribution, creating digital campaigns, and how to effectively publicize. Then, of course, one of the big ones, how do you finance things? Again, check out our website, businessofcreating.org, to find out more and see more about what we've been doing in the past. And of course, one of the things we love to hear about is what else do you want to know about? Let's create a new panel on a topic that's of interest to everybody. Moving forward, we've talked about this network, meet each other, say who you are, where you're from, and why you're here today to learn about developing and distributing entertainment projects for China. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is my super duper pleasure. Look at these fabulous people. Look at their fabulous pictures. Look at their fabulous faces. Everybody, please welcome, help me welcome our first panelist, Patrick Liu. Patrick. Patrick is the head of overseas operation at Sansang Media. He is a professional novel and screenplay writer with a background in Chinese literature. Patrick specializes in international IP localization. Projects he led by bringing US and Chinese studios include Burning Ice, which you can see on Netflix, uh, Drug War, which you can see on Amazon Prime and more. He has also served as a screenwriter on the 65 episode TV series, The Gods, which premiered on Hunan TV and now can also be found on various other platforms, iKiyi, Yuku, and Tencent. Everybody, welcome Patrick! In the middle here, we have Thomas Lim. Welcome, Thomas! <laughs> Thomas is the head of Sun Entertainment Culture Los Angeles. Uh, Sun Entertainment Culture Los Angeles is a prominent Hong Kong company and has produced several commercially successful films, including SPL2 and Paradox. You'll also remember are the film that they just financed, Palm Springs, starring Andy Samberg, which was sold for the record sale at Sundance Film Festival 2020 and was nominated at the Golden Globes for both Best Picture and Best Actor in a Comedy or Musical. Thomas was born and raised in Singapore. During his early years, he directed, wrote, and produced Roulette City and Sea of Mirrors in Macau. Both films were made on a shoestring budget, so our indie filmmakers are going to be happy to hear from you, uh, and achieved successful commercial and theatrical releases while garnering in immense press coverage in Macau and neighboring regions. Thomas is currently producing, writing, and will direct the Sun Entertainment Culture Los Angeles first Singaporean US co-production film about an Indian Singaporean girl who runs away from an arranged marriage to pursue her ballet dreams in America. Everybody, warm welcome for Thomas. And Winnie, Winnie Weiwei, everybody. We like to clap, I know. Winnie Weiwei is the senior consultant North America for Ent Group. Uh, Winnie is a veteran of the Chinese entertainment industry who brought her expertise to the United States where she obtained her M MBA from USC. Winnie's experience includes magazines, television, and film, as well as working with the largest entertainment data provider in China, Ent Group. She has extensive knowledge of the intricacies of the Chinese entertainment market. Everybody, please welcome Winnie Weiwei. And last but not least, of course, is my partner in crime, Michael Fisk. Everybody, welcome, Michael. Michael is the co-founder of our Business of Creating panel series. He is a senior marketing executive in the entertainment industry, having spearheaded over 400 marketing campaigns for studios such as Sony Pictures, Lionsgate, NBC Universal, Warner Brothers, and currently for MGM. Michael also runs Intermark, the international consulting practice focusing on helping filmmakers, producers, directors, and distributors with long-term marketing and strategy. His passion is indeed making your passion project succeed. Uh, fun fact, some of his favorite marketing campaigns that he's worked on include the James Bond franchises. He's worked on The Last Five and La La Land. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Michael Fisk. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's jump into this information. I can't wait to find out more. Michael, tell me about box office growth in China. Oh, thank you so much, Jen, for the wonderful introductions. Um, 
Yeah, there's going to, um, just so everyone knows, it's like there's going to be a few of us, you know, is the panels will kind of jumping in and out of these uh, first slides as we kind of give more data. And thanks to Winnie and team and UA for putting stuff in here. Um, we wanted to kind of just start off with giving a backdrop of more of like the box office, right? The growth in China. Um, and as you can see, it's it's grown, you know, um, quite a bit. You know, it's funny, all the, all the data kind of like, we kind of all ended up at 2019 because last year <laughs> was just so, so unique and different and kind of um, uh, just changed everything in that sense of the total amount. But, um, but you can see that, you know, it's definitely been growing um, from year to year and um, as you kind of saw, it's like with with the U with China has been at latest at nine point three, you know, and then North America eleven point three. But you definitely see the projection where it's going to kind of merge. Um, but I don't know if 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 Winnie, I don't know if you had any additional thoughts. Um, I think we're talking. Let's see, twenty twenty. We're looking at the little. Yeah. So twenty twenty, uh, the box office total is only one third of twenty nineteen, which was unfortunate. But uh, like Michael mentioned, we all see the trend. Uh, the two um, countries is, is going to compete at this 10, 11 billion per year growth for a while, which was we were thinking. <laughs> and uh, maybe the surpassing is inevitable. But uh, I mean, it happened in 2020, but in a very, in a much lower level. So, yeah. Hey, Jen, if we go to the next one, I think you're, it's going to be a similar there. chart. This one's from The Economist. If you kind of look at the blue line, which is the US with box office, and you look at China, which is the red line. Um, what's interesting is, is that if you look way on the left in 1994, they're saying The Fugitive was the first foreign theatrical release in China. And obviously things have changed significantly since then. Um, you'll see kind of like bigger films, you know, opening up with Avatar becoming the first film, you know, to break even over the 100 million mark in 2010, you know, which is just only got 11 years ago. Um, and then you even see, um, if you go further, three more years later, Pacific Rim making even more money in China than in the US, right? Which is another huge milestone. Um, and I think if you kind of saw the trajectory where um, um, until COVID hit, you know, and hit the entire world, you know, it'll be interesting to see where things stand in the next few years, but it's definitely, you see this growth of where China is, is overtaking at least on the box office receipts and, and money, you know, from a, from a purely global perspective. Um, and then obviously you see, you know, there's a lot of, we'll talk more about co-productions, which is going to be very critical, you know, when it comes down to, um, you know, releasing um, content in China. And we'll talk a little bit further about that in, in some upcoming slides. Winnie, do you want to take this on or do you want to, how do you want to? You go ahead. <laughs> okay, you want to go ahead? Okay. No, and I think Winnie deserves the credit for this because, and the reason we have some of these slides here is um, for some for some who aren't really familiar with, with um, working in China, you know, the certain terms that aren't necessarily relevant or prevalent in all markets. I mean, you'll see it in some and not in others. It definitely is really quotas are very important in China. Um, and what quotas are, it really is like defining, like it's, it's creating like a certain number of films allowed. So they put a quota, right? For example, the total number of films that you're allowed in per year, it typically impacts, you know, the big Hollywood six, you know, studios. Um, and they kind of like, there's kind of like two types, right? Obviously, you know, there's like the bigger ones where the bigger studios are kind of um, trying to get a certain number of films in this quota system. And the quota system has changed over the years. So if you're doing it on a rev share basis and you know splitting the box office results with, with China and the studio, you know, first started off, obviously we said with the Fugitive in 1994, you know, starting off and the quota was around 10 films, it jumps up um, when China was um, joining the, the World Trade Organization. So it jumped up to 20. In 2012, it rose again to around 34. Um, it's interesting, they also even have quotas of which were to be screened in 3D or even IMAX formats. And I know sometimes they kind of like move around a little bit, you know, but it kind of gives you a rough idea, you know, so you're actually having, so for, for, um, for quotas for like um, Hollywood studios, they have to kind of, you know, fight to kind of get in, you know, and so it takes, there's a, almost like a, a skill, almost like a, a way to, to get that done. I mean, then there's the second way is like a more of a flat fee buyout and and this one tends to be, you know, more on like more on the smaller films, right? You can see there's a, definitely a lot more that can get in. In 2016, there's 51 films, you know, the way to get in. Then it, um, you know, but it used to be, you know, 28 and 33. So it's kind of grown over the years as well. Um, and 
as they say, it's like there's an unofficial release, you know, obviously they kind of have a little bit more leeway in what they want it. Do they want to include more or less, you know, and they probably look at more of the, the mar- local marketplace and how local Chinese films are doing, you know, in determining of like how many foreign films actually get in every single year. Michael, I'm going to jump into our box office on the next one. Great. Winnie, do you want to take that? Yes. So, uh, um, so Michael has introduced uh, the uh, two basic ways to for your projects to get into China. One is the uh, more more for big studios, the blockbusters, uh, is the revenue sharing ones. So you can see these big numbers in box office, and they're all from Hollywood studios. Um, and then you have the next uh, um, eighty six. Uh, fix the fee or say flat fee or buy out or wholesale you can yeah. lots of terms to call it yes. uh, 86 fix the fee movies are uh, imported in China in 2019 and you can see the box office numbers are not as impressive but uh, you probably notice it's um, the countries of origins are very different like there is some varieties it's not just the Hollywood content so the Chinese audience are welcoming or uh, different type of uh, content. So that's good for our uh, more independent creators, I assume is here attending our panel. So, um, and you might also notice there is some like very old movies, like the top one, The Spirit of the Way. It's a, a Japanese animation released back in 2001. The reason I think it was picked uh, in 2019 is because in the past two decades, the social buzz around it has never died down. Like I've seen memes, the quotes from this movie all the time. So eventually some distributor was like, uh, maybe I'll take a shot at it. And uh, he made some success. So and, uh, that's the same situation with the legend of 1900. It was released all the way back in 1998 but um, it was released. So you can see it in theaters in 2019. It's quite amazing. No, I think it's so smart you bring that up because I think very often we're used to having seen films, you know, release day and date, you know, worldwide, you know, but then there's so many exceptions in China, right? Like where it's even, sometimes they go years later, as you're saying, you know, they kind of come back and have a life of their own to be able to come back years if they weren't shown before. Yeah, and I also believe that uh, this uh, trend became so strong in 2019. It's because of this phenomenon I want to talk in the next slide. So um, the next slide is the top 20 imported movies of all time. So um, I want to uh, uh, point out a trend that, uh, as um, I mean, everyone thinks we Chinese audience love Hollywood content. We do, we definitely do love the, all the explosions, all the actions, all the you know, uh, robot killing each other. <laughs> but uh, the Chinese audience actually prefers their local content more and more. So in this top 20 uh, list, only Avengers Endgame gets into the top 10 in, in the, um, all movies released uh, of all time in China. And the second one, Fast and Furious 8, ranked uh, 15th in all time. And um, I know what you're thinking, I'll comment, right? <laughs> um, and also, um, I don't know if you have noticed that there is a very important uh, Hollywood movie missing in this list, which is the highest uh, gross ever movie uh, in the United States, in North America. Um, the Star Wars, The Force Awakens, it makes so much money worldwide. It made so much money in the United States, but it didn't even get into top 20 or top 30 or top 40. It ran the 46, can you imagine? And if you include all their local movies, then it'll be uh, ranked at 109. So I just want to see, say uh, the Chinese audience, they have a different taste. And I also want to call your attention to the number 20 which is an India movie. Um, it's, it's so different from everyone else on this list because it's 100% Indian movie. It was released in December 2016 in India and domestically it made the box office to 77 million US dollars. But some movie influencer in China noticed this 
uh, movie and introduced it to uh, the whole Chinese audience. And it's, I think the reason it, it was such a huge success in terms of box office in China is because the story, the strong theme of girl power, of this father determined to train his three daughters to become boxing uh, champions. It, it, it resonates with the trend on the Chinese social media of the girl power, the women empowering at the time. So it touched the people. And then because of the social buzz was so huge, some smart distributor decided to pick it up and then release it in China. And then I think it's this huge success created the, the, the trend. Like you see the numbers jumping from 50 to 86 to 19, uh, 2019. So the, I think my point is here is, um, as long as you have a very strong story theme and your, your story is powerful, um, you can make your project a success in China. Uh, you don't have to uh, tell a Chinese story like Mulan, or you don't have to have the Chinese stars actors in it, like the Great Wall. You, you can be success there. You just need to um, pay attention to their social media, which is not Twitter or Facebook, uh, Facebook or Instagram. You need to um, pay attention there and see what the trend is and see if your story is, is you know, fitting into that. Just out of curiosity, Winnie, is like, cause I saw like you, it's mostly US and then you have India, you know, and obviously India is a huge, particularly with Bollywood and such a huge film industry. Are there other like markets that it, past the 20, like, is it, you know, do you see other other countries who will be breaking in or are they mostly from, you know, outside the US, are they mostly from like the Asia Pac region or even from Europe, say? I would say uh, Jap Japan will be a, a big competitor for that. Yeah. And then Jen, can I, is it okay if I, I saw one of the, I, there was a question on the, in the, um, by Donnie Shear. Who yeah. kind of relates to what I think, Winnie? You might be able to answer this because you were just talking about the case study, and was that more of like an action drama? And do you see comedies translating well? You know, maybe it's just overall doing well in China. Um, I, I, um, I was actually uh, surprised that the Zootopia worked. I mean, it's animation, kind of funny, but not really um, comedy. Yeah. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, let's jump into TV shows in China. Tell us more about that. Uh, let me see. So Winnie and Michael, yeah. this is still yes. I, 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 know, I, think, I think this is I think this oh, is our last. Patrick like, are all hanging. They're having yeah, a snack is, right this, now, but this, you guys are on deck. So this is our last like tech slide. China. It's our last tech slide. You know, <laughs> we want to you know a lot of it. You're going to see here is you have a lot of panelists who obviously have a lot of film experience. But we wanted to also just talk about you know as you hear in film, there's certain quotas that get involved, but in TV shows, you know, have something similar as well. You know, we kind of like there's a lot of information here. You know, and but I think the key thing to note is that there's. There's quotas on the, the total number, right? You know, you can see, the, and there's also a total number of when and during the time periods, right? So they have quotas on foreign series to no more than 30%. And then also like, when can you actually be showing it? And they're in China, they're saying, and it, who knows, it might've changed recently, but but at least you couldn't play, um, play certain um, foreign films, you know, from the key, you know, prime time viewing area from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m., right? You know, and then there's certain categories that fall within that. Um, and then just overall, like they have to kind of um, cap it at 30% of overall air time. So, so similar to just numbers, the way you see it in film, you get that, you get it more of like as a percentage, you know, it, I guess it is for television as well as during the time period, you know, during the time day period of when it happens. Okay, thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, now we need to find out more. How do Chinese versus non-Chinese writers approach storytelling? We've got several things to be looking at here about censorship rules. I love this one, a long but non-existing list of things you can't write about. Thank you, Patrick. Passing the censorship is not the only problem. There's still hope. All right, Patrick, tell me more. Okay, uh, before um, we get to that, I, I think I wanna answer the question about American comedies. Um, yeah, well, um, it, it heavily, relies on um, what kind of comedy you're talking about. 
because comedy or jokes are are heavily uh, based on culture. Uh, so uh, say American jokes, if you don't, uh, if you translate that like literally into Chinese, you probably wouldn't make a make a joke out of it. Um, say um, we had a uh, we had a friend, right? We had a. Uh, um, other comedies, like popular ones, uh, we we translate them into China, but we um, we had to avoid jokes um, of sex, violence, or uh, politics because they 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 can't pass the censorship, which I'm gonna talk about later. <laughs> so yeah, um, you gotta watch for that, and it's heavily um, cultural related. Um, so it's hard. I, I gotta tell you that. Mm. And I say, I, I do like, uh, you know, working very often in the national field, I even see it like even comedies in between American humor and British humor, you know, it's just like you, know, you get it across. And I think, to your, I, you know, I was glad you said like the type of comedy is being so important because very often like slapstick action comedy is easier than, as you said, right. verbal, right? You know, right, and that's right. like the key thing. Yeah. Spe yeah, especially verbal ones that yeah. are impossible. Actually, um, yeah. it's, you're gonna lose the lose the taste of uh, during the translation. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, let's get to censorship. That's a that's a headache we have. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's 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 a very complicated and long list. But the problem is, um, we never see the complete complete list. Never. Um, and there's no such a thing, such a list for you to refer to. Of course, we have common sense if you are familiar with trans or, or uh, the laws in China. But how about things that beyond common sense or um, you have not seen any uh, previous examples? How do you know if it's going to pass it? Well, two ways. One is you submit it for review. Uh, second thing is you have connection uh, with the department so you can talk to them before you officially uh, send it in. So definitely second way is better. Um, but you know, also you can watch for things that's on the, on TV right now. Um, as long as they're still on there, you're safe to to do the same thing. But hey, uh, they might be taken down later on. You, you don't know. So <laughs> as long as it's encouraging or it works as a, propaganda for the for the country or people it's okay you have a better luck uh but it still gives you a, a lot of room to play with to slide in what you really want to uh, talk to the people i mean it, we can still work with it and there's fun uh the second thing is uh sudden shutdown during airing uh it happened to us before it happened to me before um it's not fun but it happened <laughs> Uh, if you think passing the censorship is it, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> your, your show, while it's airing, it can be taken down from TV later on or during its airing uh, uh, um, process. I mean, uh, say a successful romantic show promotes a materialism lifestyle, so it can get banned later on because um, the bureau or department finds it like too... It, it has too much impact on people who watch it. Um, yeah, so, no, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please. Yeah, no, it's interesting you say that too, is because I've, I've seen that happen when we've been working on films, because you're right, like you spend a lot of time and effort trying to get it in and you're like, you get it in and you're like, yes, you know, but then you're like, but it's not a guarantee that it won't get yanked, you know, later on, even though it might be playing for a bit. And we've seen that with a movie where we were so excited and it was doing well, but I think it was doing too well at a times. So then it ended up, it, it was it was competing too much with local products so then it ends up getting pulled, you know? So right, right. to your point, like, even if you do get it in, it's still not a guarantee that it's gonna play it's up through the, through the run, right? Yeah. Right, it, it happened to us. Um, I, I was on this, um, I was one of writers for, for The Gods. It's a, a 35 episode TV show. It was um, airing on, on Hunan TV station. Um, and uh, we got 20 episodes left to, to air and we got banned. Uh, <laughs> and the reason they gave us is not the reason that we know. So, I, and I, I can't really talk about it. So yeah, just uh, th there's no way we can foresee it. There's no way we can avoid it, but uh, which leads us to the, the second thing, uh, third thing I want to talk about, there's still hope. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I, I can't say the censorship is getting more and more open-minded nowadays. No, actually, it's getting more strict and harder to get along nowadays, to be honest with you. Uh, but as a Chinese writer, um, as a writer who writes for Chinese market, you, you got to learn how to enjoy dancing with chainsaw. I mean, that's a skill. I'm not even joking. I'm not being... I'm, I'm, iron or something no it's it's the reality you gotta face if you want to um, make a living out of it or if you really want to make a difference here and uh, um, we are proud to say that uh, we dance as good as possible when chainsaw and we gotta learn how to sugarcoat your idea um, into a story that that can get past um, that's the number one thing I know people who are like real uh, artists they don't ban they don't compromise they they um, I respect them, but uh, to me, I see it. No matter how brilliant your idea is, or no matter how how much influence you think you can bring to the people, um, if you cannot make it to the people, it's nothing. Uh, you you cannot make a change. So you got to play by the rule. Um, that's that's the thing you want to do. And uh, but. I would say um, creating content is never about making money. But uh, if you cannot make money, who's going to invest you? How are you going to make more content, right? It's the same, same thing. Um, if It's never about passing the censorship. But if, if you cannot pass it, how do you influence people that you care? You don't even have a chance to see it, right? Um, so, um, I mean, there's no shame trying to play um, by the book. You have to, but it's a shame. Um, if playing by the book is your only goal. So my suggestion is you find um, a, a writer or a, 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 a Chinese production company as your Chinese partner, if you want to enter Chinese market, because they know that the, the market, they know the, the, the rules better. Um, and probably they had, trust me, I, I um, most of established Chinese production companies, they have needs to expand their market in the States too. So it can be beneficial to both sides. And that's the, the best long-term relationship you guys can have, right? Uh, so yeah, um, and uh, the the second point I wanna talk about is audience preference. Uh, I mean, Winnie did a very good job talking about like um, how the uh, market can, can uh, I mean, how the uh, movies can uh, can be various according to the market. The same thing, like what kind of story sells, who watches it? That's the thing you, you need to watch out when you uh, write your story on. Um, it changes with different platforms. I can give you a rough idea, not very accurate, probably um, outdated, but uh, from my experience, if your market is TV, like just like TV station, TV channels, you're looking at uh, 50 to uh, 40 to 50 female um, audience and they love romantic story, family life and extremely down to earth uh, content. And I'll give you a content uh, uh, example to to say how the difference it is. Um, Breaking Bad. Uh, I love it. It's brilliant. It's well, but if you break it down, it's actually it, it talks about how a uh, like a middle-aged crisis with cancer and money problem. It can be the same thing that we write about uh, a, a Chinese family, but we can we never take it to that uh, extreme, like drug lord, no, uh, murder, no, uh, killing kids, no, we don't do that. Uh, and I don't know, because you're looking at uh, 40 to 50 female um, um, audience, I don't know if they're going to like it or not. So you got to uh, be mindful about that. Uh, if your target is web TV, um, well, they're younger, but they're probably not from the like the major or big cities. They're less educated. And before the regulation, um, web TV uh, shows were all about sex and violence. If you look at the, the cover of the shows. Uh, but nowadays, they're getting better because the regulation came on them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, learn your market. Um, if the, 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 you think Chinese market as a whole, you, you probably need to uh, break it down because it's not. Um, you know, learn more about your platform. And uh, uh, regarding storytelling style, um, 
uh, American shows, normally uh, the first three or four episodes are like a big hook to hook the audience, right? But uh, while the Chinese, traditional Chinese TV show, we build on the foundation of the, the, the story and we're taking the slow, like on a very slow pace, but we, we're doing a solid job of creating a, a, a foundation of the story, but it lacks uh, surprise or skills to hook the audience. But um, say little teaser, but uh, before the title of each episode that we see in uh, American shows, we're start, starting to do the same thing right now. So um, we're learning from American uh, shows right now. The better way to put it is uh, we are localizing the American way to tell our story in our country to our people. Uh, so I, I say uh, it's merging. Uh, and I think it's a good way because we're learning from the best, to be honest with you. Yes. Um, well, thank yeah. you, Patrick. Oh, I'll take that compliment. Um, <laughs> I, I forgot I'm moderating. I'm so enjoying filling my head with all this information. Um, Patrick, you've been mainly talking about TV. I want to jump with, I want to jump Thomas in on this too, because Thomas, you're more film background. Are you finding the same to be true with film in China uh, as opposed to America? Well, I think the difference in um, how Chinese versus American writers approach stories is uh, pretty much got to do with um, how the culture is like in China, in China and also in America. For example, I think America stories are more about how an individual overcomes uh, obstacles to alter their circumstances. Whereas in stories in China, it's more about how the circumstances change and impact the individuals. So I think, um, I think that's how like fundamentally the uh, difference in storytelling is, especially in film. But okay. having said that, like I think Hollywood films have kind of taught, taught like the world how to watch movies. Like we all know sort of as audience as well, like three X structure, we all, we all know that after like a 40 minute mark, there's not gonna be new characters and the whole story is gonna come full circle and resolve itself because um, a while ago, I heard like 92% of all movies and mainstream cinemas around the world is Hollywood movies. So that's a big influence. And so, yeah, so I think the, um, the approach to storytelling is a little different. Uh, and sometimes when, uh, I think the American storytelling way sort of works worldwide like because it's um we are all we're all quite used to it absolutely um i'm gonna i'm gonna share my screen y'all okay so we've talked about storytelling um so do we have any key tips right now everybody wh what to do what to avoid and then as patrick you know gave us the the second act break you know dun dun come back how do we work with chinese financiers and production companies so patrick thank you for you know slipping that into act two so we can discuss it in act three so jumping back in so uh key tips to making your project more marketable to china we've been talking a little bit about it when patrick you were just saying uh to you know be aware of what are the shows are on that can give you that kind of guidance as to what's currently acceptable and going to fly with sensors. Um, you've talked a little bit about what to avoid. Tell us more, my wonderful men. Tell us more. Um, well, uh, I, I think I said um, we can, if, if you guys have more questions, I can, I can probably answer them. But uh, uh, for me, we're Refer to my experience, um, I, I think finding a, a perfect partner is the best way to go. It, it saves your time, saves your energy. And uh, as a foreigner um, working in China, especially with the, with the, the, the government or anything like that, uh, it's not that easy. So, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. I'm not saying anything bad about the government. No, not nah. just saying you need a, <laughs> you need a friend. You need some friends. You need some friends, yeah, everybody. Need friend. We all need friends. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes, you yeah. do. Thomas, what are some of your thoughts on that? Well, actually, like, just add, like, um, to the censorship part, I feel like if you're a writer without leverage in China, it's better to play safe anyway. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah fair I enough. I wouldn't push the boundary so much if I don't really know the market, like any market. Be it China or any anywhere else that that's got censorship in place. Um, yeah, so to make it more marketable, I think you got to attach cast as well. Like if you're able to because. attach cast, and also like uh, Patrick said, like to get a Chinese partner, that's crucial because otherwise, like especially if you don't really speak Chinese, then it's like impossible to navigate the um, the market. Fair when, enough. I, yeah. And to the point, like, you know, what you're saying when you talk about cast, Thomas, because I've seen this over the years, but I want to get, get your thought on it was the, 
you know, very often you'll see, you know, certain productions say, okay, well, we want to get in China. So we'll just, we'll hire some local Chinese famous actor, right. You know, on there. And are there certain things to avoid or to do when going down that route? Because I've seen the pros and cons on both sides. To hire a famous, like an American company to hire a famous Chinese writer, just in order to- a get- No, a Chinese actor. Chinese actor. Well, I think now um, Chinese actors uh, and the whole Chinese market and the, uh, um, the industry is very savvy now. Like they are quite sensitive to words. Like if yeah. like back in the day, like they would give a token role, we call it. Yeah. And, product placement and all that, that appears very cheesy. And I don't think Chinese actors really want to do that anymore. So they want substantial roles, like if the role is really good. Um, and if they are really suitable to play the role, then then by all means, then regardless of whether it's Chinese or, or any any race at all, like you have to test the right actor for it. But to get a star from, like with, as with any other market, like to get a star that's valuable in that market is definitely a way to enter the market, I would say. All right, excellent. So thank you. Uh, let me say I want to jump into our next slide, except I've lost my slide deck. That's not embarrassing at all, y'all. Um, let me pull it up this way. So we were going to be talking about Chinese producers and production companies. And I would like to know more about, you know, and in fact, uh, Himson Clark was just asking the same thing as far as, well, hey, what are some things that we should be expecting when we're working with Chinese financiers and production companies versus American? Uh, let me see, Thomas, can you tell us more about this? So we're required to pitch, which you know is the same as, as you're gonna be doing here in the United States, um, even if the writer's established. So don't expect American rules to apply. I know you were talking about ego earlier and you know, keep it in check people. <laughs> I feel like, you know, like um, when we hire writers like from from the U.S. Uh, so first of all, like I, I, I kind of feel like in Asia, many people feel like U.S. writers are very fundamentally sound at the very least because there are many trained writers and scripts are an important focus in the process of filmmaking more and more in China as well. But then like traditionally always has been a way in, in the U.S. Um, so when we tend to hire like American writers, um, especially if they're established, like sometimes they don't really want to pitch because they're established. Um, but like the Chinese way of doing, at least our way of doing is we wanna know what we are paying for. So we need something like at least a paragraph, if not a two page like, or something verbal to know where you are taking our story before we would pay you. But then if an established American writer, if the writer is established in America, sometimes they wanna get paid before mm-hmm. they write anything because that's the way America rolls. Because like an American producer will take a leap of faith because this person's got a very good track record and pay them something to start writing. And if it goes astray, then they will just replace the writer. But then the way, at least like we work, is that we want to know what we're paying for. So sort of like, so part of my job to be honest, to manage this. So like, it's sort of like different cultural expectations actually, like both sides are right in their own way. So um, definitely expect the pitch. Um, and definitely I would say, um, like the Chinese side is sometimes like, at least for us, like we're quite sensitive towards like what I, what I, call, what I call like a, like, like a, like an ego struggle. And egos are really good if you use it appropriately because everybody who's up there has got some kind of ego that they used correctly to their advantage, which is great. But then like definitely like be humble, um, bring humility to the negotiation. And perhaps like as a writer, like ask yourself, why do you want to write for the Chinese market? Why is it, why is it that you want to write for the Chinese market? Is it because the way you write is more suitable for the Chinese market? Or is it because somebody told you that the Chinese market is a big one? Or is it because you think because you're an American writer that you will naturally have an advantage in China? And then, so be clear why you want to do that. And then maybe that will like put your mind in the right place when you, before even you start the negotiation with the Chinese side. That's what I think. Fantastic. Patrick, have you had some other, ooh, sorry, Michael, am I stepping on you there? No, 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 I'm sorry, I forgot to hit you. Before, I'm sorry, Jen, is it okay? Tom said a quick question is, when you talk about like the writers, so do you see, because the way it's structured, you know, with, with the way writers get paid in projects here in the US, for example, versus China, do you see writers kind of, do rotate more do they do producers rotate to writers a lot more on the u.s side than in china like where it's kind of locked in or is it you know because it's like seems like you have you can easily replace the u.s writers a little bit more quickly or is it or is it the other way around do you feel like because you know what you're going to get up front you know what the pay is and then they rotate more through on the chinese side 
Well, for us, at least, I cannot speak for anybody else, but ourselves, like uh, for us, like when we zoom in on a writer, usually it's because um, we trust them in a certain way. We yeah. like them as a person and also we like the way they carry themselves and all that. And probably like they have some kind of a track record or if they don't have a track record, they must have pitched really well already. Then yeah. if we are with them and we start investing in, let's say, the outline and all that, we're probably going to go all the way. So that's the way we do. I'm not sure about Got the it. companies. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Got it. Thank you. Patrick, Winnie, do you have any uh, comments, you know, to add to that? Because I know both of you also have, you know, had to be on one side or the other of that, that pitch. Uh, well, um, I, I can, maybe it's a culture thing. I don't know. Or maybe just the, the companies that I, I uh, represented, they, they don't want to hire writers or hire producers. Uh, when they want to um, want to expand their business here, um, say they want to um, write a story, um, a, a, a Chinese culture uh, based story, and uh, aiming for the American market. So what we need is an American showrunner or at least an American writer, right? That's uh, that's for sure. But when I told them this, they are like. Yes, of course, we're going to find one, but uh, we are not hiring them. We want them to be on the project with us so we can share the revenue later on. So what I feel is it's not about money. I mean, those are, are pretty big companies. They're not they don't care about the money like that. Uh, it's just it's a, like it's about faith or attitude that the, the American writers show to them. Because if you jump on the project with them, they think, hey, we're on the same boat. You're going to do your best to, to make this project yourself. And uh, you're going to do it, right? It's not like you're taking money from me, so you're doing this for us, right? So that they, they need this guarantee in the project. But the American writers, they don't understand this. Hey, I'm working for you, and you're not paying me right now? What, what do you mean? Right. So that's the I think that's the difference here. So to clarify that, that sounds to me more, more like a co-production deal, if you will. Right. Well, or or it can be a Chinese production deal aiming the, the American market and hiring American writers or producers to do that for them or with them. Because they're, they're doing this for the, the for the uh, American market. OK. <clears throat> Yeah, for me, it's more like, uh, so uh, my job will be uh, to help the, uh, the, the, the companies in the early stage to develop a project. Uh, my part will be to doing at, uh, analysis for data, say uh, your, your project will be very appealing to this demographic or uh, this type of audience. But uh, for me personally, I believe in a good story. So um, I think story over data, actually. So. All right, and uh, the other question we have on that slide is, okay, so great, uh, I'm being approached by this company or I want to approach uh, you know, a Chinese company. Where am I finding the information to find out how fantastic or not they are? Where, where am I going? Hollywood Reporter, help me out. Ask your friends. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ask your Chinese friends. <laughs> you know. So everybody, uh, Thomas, Winnie, Patrick, Michael, I'm just going to put your cell phone numbers in the chat for everybody so they can just ask you tomorrow, okay? <laughs> no? What? <laughs> I'm going to mute, mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think you got to ask your friends and you got to keep track of like what company is making what films. But then there's so many companies out there. Like As writers, I don't want to encourage you to like just do that to fill all your time. You got to be writing all the time because you're like. <laughs> you wrote two lines today, but by God, you did some research. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay. Yeah. So, so kind of similar to the U.S. in that respect and other markets. It's you know, hey, start talking to people, start writing down your info, do your. I, I hate to use the G word, but Google it. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, let me see. So that's that slide. Oop, come here. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're jumping into the end right now, which really upsets me because I want to keep talking. Can we do, Jen, do you think, can we go into some of the Q&A that they have? Yes, I, when I was monitoring it, most of it we had answered in some sort of uh, fashion or another. That was why I was like, okay, we're good. 
Um, so it was talking about, uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about censorship and um, can black lead films succeed in the Chinese market? Winnie, you talked about that a little bit already with it being about story and, uh, you know, Green Book was one of our top imports there. Don't know if we have any other thoughts on those. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I, uh, um, I, I believe uh, the, the black lead movies are definitely uh, having a, a great future there too. Um, I think Black Panther did very well in terms of box office. And uh, like Michael mentioned, we love Will Smith. Everyone loves Will Smith. That's actually, uh, even before I came to the US, I worked for this uh, uh, film website, M Time. I don't know if any of the audience know. Yes, that. yes, I worked with them a lot on campaigns. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the first uh, um, live streaming, like uh, so. Will Smith could not come, to, uh, uh, could not came uh, all the way to Beijing to do the film premiere, but he agreed to show on screen. That's back in like two thousand nine, right? So that's before all the Zoom business, all, all this. I mean, now we're so used to uh, all, everything online, but at that time it was it was like a pioneering, <laughs> but Will Smith did it and we we made a huge success on, um, I, I think it's Men in Black too. Yes, right? <laughs> okay, yep. So definitely. Yes. Okay, and yeah, we do have Michael, you're like, people are jumping into our Q&A now. I love this. Uh, so Esther's wondering about remakes. Uh, is there interest in remakes? going both directions into the American market, into the Chinese market. Um, I, I've seen lots of remakes, um, the remakes of uh, even not, uh, I mean, not limited to US titles. Like there was a very successful Italian title, The Perfect Stranger. Uh, the, I mean, I think US is making a remake too, right? The, the Chinese already uh, did it and it's pretty successful in terms of box office. And our final question right now, does the Chinese audience seem to gravitate more towards original ideas or familiar public domain IP? Um, and you guys remember, uh, double check, make sure you're putting it in the Q&A if you're asking a question, okay? Uh, so do does the Chinese audience prefer original or kind of public domain? <laughs> Both, both, a good story, a good story. Yeah. Both, for sure. It's hard yeah. to say. The, the thing is, I, I don't think they care. Yeah. As long uh, as it's good, yeah. Yeah, as long as it's a good story. I mean, the uh, like the Monkey King story keeps going. Yeah. And now the I mean, creators are looking into the heritage more, like the white snake story, the biggest yeah. animation, <laughs> the biggest animation this summer, and the uh, Michael's favorite to Nurja. Yeah, uh, yes, I love that one. <laughs> These are public domain stories. Yeah. But Wolf Warrior 2, the, the, the highest uh, gross movie of all time, it's it's original from Wu Jing's song. Right. So. I mean, I, I feel like public domain IP are more like an anniversary thing that they will be um, brought back on every 10 years or five years. It's, it will always be there. And there are people always interested in it. But original ideas, that's the way to go. I mean, why not? Uh, I, we have a couple questions here about different genres, everybody. So is sci-fi easier to pitch than cultural? And then somebody's asking also about LGBTQ content. So sci-fi, tell me about sci-fi content. Is that easier to pitch? I'm just, gonna say, I'm just gonna say wandering earth. Like that seems like, you know, it's very sci-fi. It seems to do extremely well, um, but. Yeah, I think it's the uh, kind of similar situation to the uh, successful IP already. Like if you're a sci-fi writer, you have published the books then, and you have a book fan base there and it's easier to pitch that way. Right, yeah. I mean, the, the Chinese investors that I know, yes, they love sci-fi because it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's easier to travel to China. 
um, in comparison to to cultural ideas. But the thing is, sci-fi uh, movies are are harder to make, right? It normally, requires requires more budget, and uh, uh, it depends on like what kind of sci-fi you're you're talking about. If like really sci-fi, sci-fi, man, that's that's like big, right? So they're gonna be very uh, cautious about that, and it's gonna take you a long time. But yes, the, the 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 general idea of the of sci-fi is popular in China. Yes. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are um, getting towards the end of our discussion about things. We have a couple more slides that are talking about um, you know the censorship boards. We've talked about them a bit, uh, but let's go ahead and share this just to kind of do a quick recap on that. So yeah, how do you get your film accepted by the CFG? Uh, so Michael, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it. I'll give, I think UA, you kindly added these here. Um, these are these are just really important to know is, is that, you know, when you, you have to, you know, it's all, I guess it's a little different than the MPA, you know, where you get a rating, you know, this, you know, the MPA doesn't say whether you get in or not. They kind of put a rating, a PG, PG 13 R and then C 17 and so on. And um, this one is more of like about whether or not you would even get it in, you know? And I think um, the critical thing, and I think, I, I think Patrick, you were mentioning this and apologies if it wasn't about, you know, the kind of the importance of like submitting stuff early, you know, and having a connection to the department, right? And the key thing is, is you want to kind of submit it early, you know, obviously a script stage, you know, and then obviously when it's totally completed. The key thing, though, is, is hopefully if you have and you're working very closely with those closer on the ground that are close with the departments, and they're kind of working behind the scenes and kind of helping out, you know, to kind of guide and find a, and 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 help you avoid certain obstacles, right? There's certain things that will be censored. You know, there's certain things, there's an entire thing about maps and um, and like which regions belong to China. There's certain usage of flags that you have to be very careful of, you know, that you wanna make sure that don't appear in the film, you know, and that might offend the censors. Um, and knowing someone there that will help out and guide you is really critical. Um, the one thing though, too, is, is that you want to kind of, it's almost like you want to kind of do it all behind the scenes and get it up front because once you officially, officially submit, submit your film and, you know, God forbid it doesn't get accepted, technically there is a way you can resubmit it, but you know, it's, it's such a long shot, right? You know, you, you want to do all the legwork beforehand. You don't want to go in running in and submitting it immediately and then being like, okay, well, they didn't like this and this and this, and then try to resubmit it it's almost like it's too late. Like once you kind of submit your final application, you've better done every single thing beforehand to make sure that, you know, you've screened it properly behind the scenes to the right people at the right times and gotten feedback and making adjustments before it goes in. Um, you know, but again, it doesn't mean I've seen it where a film has been able to reapply, but it's, it's rare, it's really rare, you know, to do so. I'm also again checking the questions in the live stream, everybody. Oh, any, anyway, never mind. I'm going to stop that share because I'm showing you what's on my screen, everybody. Looking at everybody's bios and headshots and everything today. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, let me see. Wait a minute. Um, so, we are ask, actually getting towards our other questions. Um, again, you guys, I'm trying to look at the chat and the Q and A at the same time. Don't put it in the chat because I'm not going to get to it there. Put it in the Q and A. Um, so let me see. And while while you're doing that, I think you know, Thank kind you. of one of the last, I guess, one of the final, like one of the final things I want to kind of just at least say, well, before we answer other questions, is. You know, it's like China as similar to all other countries, you know, China has its own languages, its own, the way government works, the way the culture works, you know, and I think the key thing is to know the rules, the culture, the languages, you know, the way things are going to be. And then that's when you become successful. Like, you know, and I think, you know, I, I, I say, I just want to avoid people thinking like, oh my God, like China is this like abstract, you know, market, you know, I mean, it is obviously a huge economic power and market, and it's something we have to be very, um, you know, uh, cognizant of, 
But it's, you know, but if you look at every single market, you know, when we work with, you know, films and TV shows in, in Brazil, you know, what you have to kind of get there or getting in films and TV shows into Saudi Arabia, you know, it's like every single country, every single market is going to have its nuance, right? And China is just, an, a, again, like the nuances that films and TV shows here in the US, it's going to be a different one. But knowing what they are and there, and there might be, you know, as I think Patrick, you're saying dancing with chainsaws, there might be, you know, more with chainsaws at sometimes, you know, with, with, with China, but at the same time, if you know what they, what, what that game and the rules are, it'll make you a lot more successful in getting your projects there. And I think, yes. And so Jen, I think these are, you know, some of the key things just to kind of, you know, yeah. be mindful of those rules, right? Yeah. Get them up on the screen. Everybody now's the chance to take your picture. Uh, so after that, yes. So, uh, you know, portrays, Things in a negative light, incites hatred, discrimination, violence, terrorism, is obscene, vulgar, against Chinese values. Patrick, as you were talking about earlier with materialism, great example of that, uh, encourages supernatural beliefs. So we've been going through our questions. Bam, here are some resources for you, everybody. Chinese and Entertainment, Screen Daily, Asia Society, and CAPE. Uh, let me see. I'm going to let people get a moment for that. And then we are, I, I don't want to stop. I'm enjoying learning all this information. And we, Michael, we didn't even get to talk too much about, you know, how to market differently within the different countries, mm -hmm. territories, uh, US versus mm -hmm. Chinese that we, we were having a good backstage discussion about it. So I think we're going to have to have a part two, everybody uh, developing and distributing and marketing projects for China. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we are in a moment. Michael, do you have the survey link handy or do I? Need I, will, to... I will bring it and put it into the chat, correct? Love it. Yes, please. Okay. So yeah, this time, everybody, we are going to the chat. Uh, please take our survey. Uh, we are going to be giving away four final draft downloads uh, for people that fill in the survey. So please do. Uh, please do, even if you filled it in before. I'm thinking of Julius there in our audience. I love that he shows up every time you rock. Uh, but that way, it helps us also to show potential sponsors that, hey, we have people that show up and we give important information and we have people that show up repeatedly. So ladies and gentlemen, please fill in our survey, win a possibility of final draft. Thomas is going, I hope it's me. I hope it's me. <laughs> <laughs> I just added it, Jen, right there. Awesome. So that is in the chat right now. And hey, check us out. Follow us on socials, everybody. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Again, go to our website, businessofcreating.org. Join our family. Learn, empower yourselves. Be successful with your projects. And that, with that having been said, everybody, Thank you so much. Thank you, Enid and Kat at the Writers Guild Foundation. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Winnie. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, UA. Thank you, Cleo. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I cannot wait to do this again. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, yes, to... and a big, a big thank you to Jen for moderating it. So oh, thank you so much. <laughs> more, more like listening. Thank you, Jen. So much good info. All right, I'm going to stop my share and fill in our survey. Let's do lunch, everybody. Uh, oh, wait, let me put your, your you know, direct numbers in the chat for everybody yeah, to call yeah. your questions tomorrow. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm out of here. I got to go take the survey. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.